This episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, the easiest way to play season-long fantasy football. Underdog Fantasy sets your perfect lineup at the end of each week, so no management and no Tuesday nights on the waiver wire. All you do is the most fun part, draft the best team and win cold, hard cash. Play now at underdogfantasy.com and they'll match your first deposit up to $100 if you use code SPOTIFY. Empire. Welcome to the latest edition of All's Caps with former Capitals defenseman Carl Osner. I'm AP Hockey writer Steve Wino. Later, we'll be joined by NHL.com's Adam Kimmelman. We'll be, Carl, we got plenty to discuss before that. We're going to get to Michael Buble because the listeners have wanted to hear about the Michael Buble jersey thing in D.C. Uh, but first, Alex Ovechkin's back in D.C., back in Arlington, on the ice at MedStar. I know you're not on the ice with him right now as we're recording this, but great to have him back, right? Yeah, it's always nice when when you see some of the big guys come back, right? It's a uh... It's like a slow trickle of players when they come in and and the the local guys obviously are here the whole time then you get a couple a lot of times young guys will come in just kind of like show faces as, as look i'm here i'm ready to go and and they're around and then you know guys with families that are here for school kids are here for school and they show up and and then a lot of the european guys and stuff so it's kind of nice uh, and when the big guy comes back he just kind of changes the dynamic on the ice because your uh, three on three scrimmages go from being kind of kind of good hardworking scrimmages to all of a sudden good hardworking with a ton of skill out there right. and uh and then you have to sharpen up a little bit more so it's yeah it's great great to have him back on the ice and then people who are who are local here can come and watch him skate too which is which is always fun so uh so yeah it's it's a it's a good time things are starting to heat up biosteel camp that everyone is always watching is all over with all those big names that are out there and then everyone starts heading back to their city, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, and Alex and his family had to, had to go back through either Istanbul or Dubai to get back to. So they're hopping, skipping, jump to get back from from Russia. It, it's I'm glad he's back in DC and training camp opens in I guess two weeks from a little bit less than two weeks from today. Yeah, it's uh, it's weird. I feel every year the training camp start date is has been different. Like the last four or five years now, it's hard to keep track on when when things are happening. And yeah, then, rookie camp is next week. Yeah, rookie camps next week, and just had the rookie showcase, or that's still going on, I believe, today. So that's kind of neat thing to to have in the city as well. You've been around watching it. How's that look? It's cool, and and we'll, we'll talk to Adam Kimmelman from NHL.com about that too, because he was here with a bunch of the prospects. But it's like a it's a, a upper deck does a a shoot like a bunch of photos for for trading cards. Got, and they get a bunch of promo photos and things done and a little bit of media training kind of dealing with us for a lot of these kids. Hendrix LaPierre, who we're going to hear from a little bit later, he's already great. I mean, he at, at, at his age, is already phenomenal at all that stuff. That's huge. Yeah, and they're probably getting paid, too, if Upper Deck's doing it. They probably love it because all those rookies are getting they, a little correct. cash in their pocket, too. So. Correct. Yes. There's, <laughs> there's one, one of the best things is when you get, you get a letter from Upper Deck saying, will you please sign these cards for X amount of dollars? And you're like, yes. This is the sweetest thing ever. I remember doing getting those in junior. I think it was so much fun. They give you like two or three thousand bucks to sign like five hundred hockey cards, and now you think you're like the richest person in the world. You take all the boys out to Earls and go shopping, and next thing you know, a week's gone by and you got no money left. <laughs> but you've had <laughs> you've had a nice week, so it's funny. It still still happens today. Yes. Um, speaking of a uh, French Canadian Capitals players, Matthew Pro announced his retirement this week. Uh, congratulations to Matthew, a friend of the show, was a guest on this on this show. Uh, Carl, you talked to him about it. How, how, how's Matthew feeling about this? I think he's pretty happy. I mean, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't didn't want to get into too many specifics, you know, because it's pretty fresh. Well, I mean, it's it's fresh to us, you know. But he's at the, he's at peace with the decision, like that's. Oh thing. yeah, sure. yeah. You know, he's had he's had a lot of tough injuries over his career, right? Yeah. He's had some some pretty bad concussions he's had a lot, a lot of uh, broken bones and stuff like that um you know been to a few teams he's got young kids too it i i got the sense you know he's just happy right he's just happy to, to not have to worry about it you know preparation and all that it's it's all the same stuff that that i think when you when you initially make your decision it's like it's just like ah, exhale right i can i can just live and and not worry about what i'm doing day-to-day stuff and then as the season goes on i'm sure he probably go through the same thing as like, you know, I kind of wish I was out there with the guys or, you know, on, on the road trips, dinners, all that stuff. But 
but yeah, it, it's. I, th- I think he's happy. I think he he's had an amazing career too. Like for for not being a very big guy, he's had quite an amazing career. You know, to be able to to be be as sticky as he has been, and uh, and be out there and and be successful too. So, very happy for him. And uh, it'll be it'll be a nice nice transition into whatever he decides to do now. Yeah, he played he played seven hundred eight regular season, fifty one playoff games. So yeah, pretty good career for Matthew Perot. Pretty good, and, and being in for quite a few of those too. So yeah. probably uh, rostered for got to be close to close to a thousand. Probably on the roster for nine hundred something games. So yeah, it's a it's a hell of a pro career, and uh, you know, very happy. Like me, man, we we came up together at the exact same time. So it's uh, interesting to see all these guys that are kind of calling it quits around around that uh, that that are from that era. I guess you could say. You know, yeah. Fairzy, Fairzy's done now this year. Beegs is is done this year. You know, I'm I'm done. Perry's done. The only one that's really kind of sticking around is uh, is Carly still from that from that crew. So it's kind of interesting to see see how it's all happened. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, now Tom Galitti, friend of the show, also was as asked about the Michael Buble thing. Uh, <laughs> so this. So for those of you who are not familiar with this, in DC uh, at Capital One Arena during a, sh- a show, Michael Buble put on a Capitals jersey, not just a Capitals jersey, a Carl Alsner Capitals jersey. Um, you are obviously buddies with with Michael Buble. Can you explain how this all went down? Yeah, it's it's pretty funny. So so we we were in a fantasy league, uh, fantasy football league together. Um, one of my good buddies back home is his uh, trainer, and so we we're all in this league, and we have been joking around about different punishments and stuff like that, and, and what we were gonna do. And we had said that it'd be funny if the if the loser, uh, we all go to one of the concerts. And then the loser gets pulled up on stage to uh, to have to sing a song in front of everybody. <laughs> and we thought that would be funny. And, and then we, we realized that he was coming into D.C. and uh, he's got a pretty good um, uh, jersey collection of players. And I had told him that I was going to I was going to run up uh, out on stage and toss him toss him a jersey because I'd been we'd been talking about getting one. Uh, he's on his display or whatever at his house. And uh, and so right before I think it was yeah the morning no, no, it was the day before I told him like, Hey, got my seats going to be there. I'm tossing a Jersey at you. Um, hopefully I don't get kicked out as something like something along those <laughs> lines. And he's like, oh, I got a better idea. And so, um, so we kind of had planned it. That he's like, you know, he's going to go through the whole show. And then when, when the last song comes on, uh, he'll walk by and, and, uh, and we'll do the exchange then. So I didn't, I didn't know exactly how that was going to happen. You know, the stage kind of goes right through the, through the middle and, mm-hmm. He moved our seats from where they were to right beside it, so it was an easier toss. And uh, and I, I wasn't expecting him to put it on or to perform with it or anything like that. I thought it was just going to be like, oh, sweet, thanks for the jersey. Maybe maybe some sort of go caps or whatever. Fans took care of that, getting the getting the caps cheer going there, which was pretty sweet. And uh, and yeah, it ended up ended up being amazing you know, to see to see the jersey go on and. Be, be performed with in a different if in a different <laughs> way at a concert instead of a hockey game was was kind of a you know even for even for me to see it like that was a very very neat feeling um happy that he did that and he seemed to be pretty pumped about it too it was one of my winter classic jerseys so it was it was you know a pretty important jersey to me but i got a, a few sitting in the basement that i was trying to figure out what to do with and so so yeah so we did that and uh people were pretty pretty excited about it. there's a lot of michael buble fans out here yeah, and and then saw the photo of, of you and Mandy with with Michael after the show. Yeah, so that was actually uh, prior to the oh, show. Prior to the show, okay. Yeah, because so he's got his kids, two his two sons that are out uh, with them. I don't know if they still are, but they were at that point on tour, which is so cool if you think about it. Like yeah. how sweet is that to bring your kids around with you on on the road and all that. So that was neat. Got to see him uh, before. He had his football out with him too, so we tossed the football around a little bit and. Uh, and uh, you got because those tours are so strict. Like, you know, he was missing a ton of his band um, for a lot of that because they all had COVID, and so like he got a rapid test and all that stuff. And then you can hang out for a little bit and and just kind of shoot the shit. So it, it was neat, very neat. That's a crazy life. I don't know how they do it, being on the road as much as they are, and and everything the way it's scheduled. But man, he's he's got it figured out, and it is a very very fun show. You don't realize like like the 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 guys that do what he does where they just are up there singing mm-hmm. they have to have a really good performance as well great band very very funny good banter back and forth a little bit risque it's uh it's it's pretty fun to to hear some of the stuff he he'll joke about 
Um, but yeah, it's, it, I highly recommend going to watch him watch him perform because it's, yeah. it's pretty impressive. That was, that was a really cool moment for for you and, and Michael. Um, we'll get to some more uh, Hendrix Lapierre stuff, uh, Capitals prospects when we come back uh, on All's Caps with Adam Kimmelman from NHL.com. Um, obviously, I feel I feel different. You know, uh, a year is a lot of days for me as a, as a twenty year old guy. So I feel like I've learned a lot in the past couple of months, and every experience that I learn in hockey makes me. You know, grow as a player, as a person, and so um, again, I have the same mentality as last year, which is to make the team. But uh, you know, I, I do feel better. I feel like I've had a great summer. I've put myself in a position to have success, so I'm very excited. What'd you learn? What did you learn about yourself? Up there? I mean, it's it's mostly little details, but just when I was up here last month, uh, not last month, but you know, for the first month last year, I, I learned so many things just the way the guys prepare themselves to have success, and it's a veteran group. You know, they've been there for a while, so they know what it takes. Um, and during the season, just to, I, you know, I, I had little little obstacles this year once again. I think it's part of the part of the game, but uh, at the end of the day, it's going to make me a better person. And I've been here for for three weeks. Uh, you know, with training with uh, you know, I trained in the morning with John Carlson. Um, he's, he's what thirty something. He's, he's dominated the league for a couple of years, but he's still working very hard. And so for me, as a young guy coming in, it's very motivating to see, and it just gets me you know more hungry. That was Capitals prospect Hendrick LaPierre at the NHLPA Rookie Showcase earlier this week. This is All's Caps with former Capitals defenseman Carl Alsner. I'm AP Hockey writer Steve Wino. We're joined by NHL.com's Adam Kimmelman, one of the, their prospect experts. Adam was at the NHLPA Rookie Showcase at MedStar Capitals Iceplex earlier this week. Uh, Adam, I'm curious your thoughts on, on Capitals prospects in general, but specifically Hendrick LaPierre after we saw him here in Washington last year. Well, I think the biggest thing with Hendricks is can he stay healthy, right? That was the big question going into his draft year. He had a couple of concussion issues. You know, the talent is unquestioned. If you've watched him play, you know, you watched him in, in the – I watched him in the Quebec League. You watched him a little bit. You know, he was able to make the Capitals out of training camp last season. That was just the only question about him was can he stay healthy? Can he be physically strong enough to handle the rigors of the NHL? And he certainly did well enough in the brief time he was in Washington. He went back to the Quebec League. He had a decent year, not a, not a you know, blow you out of the water year, but he had a pretty good season. I think they need him to be – to hit that next level, either him or Connor McMichael, you know, Nick Backstrom leaving the lineup for, you know, probably the season, maybe longer leaves a really big hole in the middle of the ice. And they need one of those two guys to step up because I don't think, you know, the optimal world is TJ Oshie is your second line center. If you're a Washington Capitals fan, Dylan Strom, it, no, Dylan Strom is the optimal for now. Dil well, for now, yes. But I think eventually you do need one of, you hope one of those two guys is able to take that next step whether it's Hendricks LaPierre, whether it's Connor McMichael. But I think in an ideal world, one of those guys shows they're ready to be a difference maker in the middle of the ice. Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, a lot of these teams, are they got the homegrown homegrown talent that's uh, that's coming in and taking over and making an impact. And I think that, you know, the, the Caps have maybe struggled with that over the last few years. You know, there's a, a good chunk of time where it was – it was just a revolving door of players that would be drafted and then stick around. And now, you know, maybe there's, it, it's died down a little bit, but I'm curious, like I watched him uh, over the summer at the, uh, the, what do you call it? The rookie camp that they have uh, summer camp. And he was, he was the best, you know, like by far the best he has it. I'm curious what he looked like on, on the ice in, in this showcase. Well, there wasn't really a lot of – this was more of a very relaxed setting. You know, it's a purposely mm -hmm. low-key event. I talked to Matthew Schneider from the NHLPA, and they keep it very low-key. The, the time on the ice was more like, hey, let's videotape your goal celebration for oh, gotcha. promotional videos. Let's do kind of fun, pass-the-puck kind of stuff. Years the past the informal EA, scrimmage, yeah. The little, little informal whatever scrimmage. Yeah, yeah. yeah the three-on-three -three game, nobody's really going at, at, at great speed or anything. But, you know, the on-ice stuff is – it's you're not going to really see a lot at a at an event like that. The more it's more what he does at rookie camp, when they get into the rookie games, when they get into into you know training camp coming up here, that's where you're really going to see the rubber meet the road for him. If he can be you know strong enough physically to hold up to whatever pressure he's going to face for an 82 game season, because it's time for him you know to be a guy who's ready to be a difference maker for him they drafted him at a spot in the draft where you expect him to be a difference maker and you're right carl that washington really hasn't had a lot of draft capital the last couple of years well now they finally got a couple of first round draft picks mcmichael lapierre they need those guys now to start being you know the guys that they're expecting them to be that they're hoping that they can become 
Yeah. And th- so this is a little bit off topic, but I'm curious to get your guys' thoughts because talking about the draft and, and how well a team drafts, this is this is from a guy that I play hockey with, my men's league, Mike Siegel. I got to give him a shout out because he's we've talked about this a bunch. He's He said he feels like there should be some sort of cap relief uh, for homegrown talent. So, for example, you know, Alex Ovechkin uh, drafted here. His contract against the cap would be, say, for example, cut in half. So instead of it being, you know, he's what he's making ten million most of most of his career. Instead, because he was drafted by the team, only five of that counts towards the cap. The other five gets <clears throat> put aside because the team has done a good job keeping him. And so for every player that you draft and develop, you get a little bit of a break uh, against your against your cap, which I think is a heck of an idea because then it gives teams incentive to be, you know, really good through the draft and. And, and have these players you know be a part of the organization for a long time versus you know teams with a lot of money just going out there and and pulling everybody I, I think it's a great idea and I'm curious what your guys thoughts are on that I think it's interesting you know I, I'm all for teams being rewarded for what they do in the draft I think the closest we have to that now is if you resign your own you know free agent to be you can get them for eight years right. instead of seven right um, whether that can be modified in the future I think that's a that's a wonderful discussion point, I'm sure, when they get around to discussing the next collective bargaining agreement. You, you, you guys just don't want any, any player movement, do you? Because like <laughs> you watch the NBA and guys are jumping around and people love the offseason. And hockey people, and you know this, Carl, are so risk adverse. You want the longest deal possible. You want the most security possible as a player, as a general manager. That would just make sure that no one ever leaves. Well, it, it's tough. It's tough to move cities, right? Like, it, it's I understand get... this from a people standpoint, but like people, yeah. lo- like people love the free agency when it's your choice. I mean, the trades are a little bit different, but like when it's your choice and you get to pick, and you got like LeBron doing a show and going from Miami to Cleveland, LA, like it's fun. It's objectively yeah. fun. Yeah, but it, it, it's different too in basketball. Like one player can, can I know, I know, completely change yeah. a team, right? So it's a big deal. You go and play with your buddies. You need to have two or three good players on a team, and you can win a championship, right? It's a little different in hockey and you want to try and build it up and and so so yeah so you give, give the gms a chance to you know to really build up from the foundation and and yeah more incentive to it i, I think it I, th- I think it's a conversation to be had and i really like that idea yeah well, and, i'm and curious look. well I'm, I'm curious you know you've seen it with the austin matthews kind of thing like he signed for five years well he's going to get another you know a chance to go through this again and and i'm wondering if instead of you know to your point steve about the whole being risk guys being risk averse Maybe there is a little bit more with this new era of players where they're more willing to sign short-term contracts and reassess themselves every couple of years. Maybe maybe that's what this generation of players wants. Yeah, I, I, I mean, Carl, Carl I mean, you, I'm sure you've, you've seen that with, with guys coming through the league too. Is There is that shift. I mean, Austin Matthews a little bit. P.K. Subban did this too. He took a bridge deal out of arbitration uh, or before, like, during, after his first arbitration and bet on himself and then got the huge contract out of it. Yeah, I mean it's it's a bet, right? You got you got to yeah. you got to be pretty confident in your in your ability to to do something like that. But it's happening it's happening less. Like these like who is it? Uh Stutzel just Eight signed years. a yeah, yep. massive deal right after his after his his entry level contract. It's just happening so much more Kyle now. McCarr, and, same thing. Yeah, so it's just it's a little bit it's a little bit different. I mean there's there's another um I guess branch to this idea that if you had a uh homegrown uh, not not homegrown, like a, a local a local player. You could also get some sort of uh, discount. I think they do that. What was he saying? I don't know if it was in soccer. They did it. They did it somewhere else too. So like for example, Austin Matthews goes to goes to Arizona, plays there. They also get some sort of break, you know. So now Arizona can offer Matthews, let's say, fifteen million dollars to come there, and Arizona only only has him against the cap for ten. You know, like there, there's a lot of different different options here just to get get a little bit more I don't know like some of these teams that have Dallas is producing a lot of players or Texas is producing a lot of players Florida is now too I don't think Florida is a hard place to get guys to come and play anyways but but you know yeah, just, no just a little, yeah yeah exactly just to have kind of a different different level to it I don't know I but but guy, guys are signing massive deals right out of their entry-level contracts they don't they don't necessarily have to bet on the yeah. deals so much anymore there's a, a certain type of player that is overall it's kind of just like here you go. Here's your money. Stick around for eight years and see what you can do. I think there's players that still have that killer instinct, but I think it sometimes takes it away from them too. 
Yeah, and, and, and what I think Brian McClellan has done this year, at least, is he's taken the LaPierre's and kind of shifted the pressure back on guys like that by bringing in a Dylan Strome, bringing in a Connor Brown. Uh, this might be the last year under Peter Laviolette, but it's the first year in Philadelphia under John Tortorella. Adam, you're based in Philly. A lot of comments about John Tortorella and the locker room there. Uh, we're, we're, we're curious about that and how you think that's going to unfold in, in Philadelphia and the potential chaos. Well, it's going to be very interesting, you know, and, and chaos is probably the best word for it. And <laughs> and just in talking to Torts and not not so much, you know, everybody listened to the, the serious interview he did on Wednesday. But, but I, you're spoke, talk, I yeah. spoke to him. Yeah, I spoke to him earlier in the summer and he embraces that kind of stuff. He relishes that kind of conflict because he believes that when you go through it and you come out the other side, the relationship that he'll have with the player and the player will have with him will be that much stronger. Now, I don't know if every player that has gone through the, with him with that <laughs> would have that same opinion, but, you know, that's that's his mindset. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's how he feels. He looks forward to that kind of stuff because he thinks it helps build he, – he, he sees it as honesty, and from his point of view, when he gets after a guy, it's not because he doesn't like that guy. It's because he cares about him and he wants him to be the best player possible. Now, again, the players who played for him might not all share that opinion, but that's his mindset, and that's where he comes from. So, you know, when he says things like, you know, I, I have doubts about the room, I think it, there's no there's no lack of honesty there. And, and look, I've, I've been around this group of players, and, and you could tell that there was some sort of disconnect. You know, Elaine Vino is a very good coach, and they were very good for one year, and then he didn't suddenly become a, a – a not not become a good coach. He didn't forget how X's and O's work and, and things went sideways. And Mike Yo is not a bad coach. But again, things went sideways there for reasons un, unexplained. So mm -hmm. was it a bad mix of players? Was there something, you know, not go, going on in the locker room? And then from the media standpoint, not being in there on a daily basis the last two years, it's hard to really assess what it's like. But you could just, in talking to players, you could tell that there was there something – Something not right there. So when when John comes out and he says, "I don't like the way the room works," there's some truth to it. From you know an outside standpoint, you know there are some issues there that need to be worked out. So he comes at it with a bullhorn, and he's going to make everybody know what's going on. But yeah, he, he's not saying anything. He didn't say anything different Wednesday that he hasn't said pretty much since the day he got hired back in June. I went back and I looked at my story on NHL.com from when he got hired. And the lead was John Tortorella feels his first job is to change the culture and reestablish the standards yeah. of what it <clears> means <throat> to play for the Philadelphia Flyers. So this is a common theme. So the fact that it became a little bit of a, a story yesterday was just because he had a larger platform and a louder bullhorn to say it through. But yeah, there are some issues there and it's going to be interesting to see how they're able to work their way through it starting, you know, the 21st when they have their first meetings. Yeah. I I he's not wrong about about going through a little bit of a, a discussion with players or challenging them and then come out the other side. But but some players just don't react well to it, you know. So right. then they then they just go away and then they disappear because, you know, it's like I, I can't stand torts. He yelled at me or he's telling me I'm not I'm not a good leader in the room. And then they just they shrivel up and die. Right. Like that. It happens. Unfortunately, there's some some players that can't do it. And then there's the ones that will get a lot better. Right. There's been tons of players that have come out and said that that torts changed my 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 entire mentality around the for game sure. and, and how to play hopefully that they got those guys in in philly i had, had heard for years that it was a a pretty pretty intense country club uh atmosphere there and and although it was very fun you know you have seasons like they they have had where where they just don't end up doing anything so i first thing that goes through my mind though is when when torts is hired and i'm on that team is oh crap training camp's <laughs> gonna suck He's gonna ride you all year long, but at the same time, could could really do something special, at least for a couple of years until guys get sick of him. Yeah, you know, I I go back to the story that Jay Feaster told me years and years ago when he was the general manager in Tampa. This was, I think, two thousand two. You know, when when Tortorella and Vinny LeCavalier were having their their daily wars, <laughs> he pulled both of them into his office and he and he sat and it was the three of them in the room. He closed the door and he said to Vinny, "I'm not firing the coach." And he said to Torts, I'm not trading this guy. So you guys got to figure it out. Figure out how you're going to get along because you guys are here for the long haul. And mm -hmm. two years later, they want to stay in the cup. So, you know, you, you, you need good leadership from above. 
the mat. So I, I think Chuck Fletcher is going to have a real big part in how those relationships, how, how those bridges don't get napalmed, mm-hmm. you know, how those bridges are able to withstand the mortar rounds are going to come, you know, when Torts gets into one of his moods and he starts going after guys and guys are going to complain and, and they're going to complain to him. They're going to complain to upper management and it's going to be on Chuck people like Chuck Fletcher, Danny Briere, Brent, Brent Flair. They're going to have to be able to help keep the bridges from getting blown up. Yeah. Also, that's the only way it's going to work. There's also no guy who's big enough on that team. Like Alex Ovechkin, if he didn't like a coach, has a power. Nick Backstrom right. had a power. There, there's nobody on this team anymore without Claude Giroux that even has that power. So this is towards his this is his world now. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think there's something to say that you know Sean Couturier is probably the closest yeah. guy to that. But but Sean is a guy that roll with the punches is is exactly what his mo is. Whatever the coaches want him to do, and he's played for whether it was a guy like Peter Laviolette who had a pretty high intensity level or a more laid back guy like Dave Haxtall or, or Mike Yo, he prospered. And, you know, it didn't matter who was calling the shots. He just did what he was told and he did it to the best of his ability. So I, I think Sean's going to be a guy who is going to be very big in that room as far as making sure guys understand that, hey, he just because he's loud, you just just deal with it. Just do what he wants, and we'll be better as a team. Because look, for all his bluster and all his the noise that comes with John Tortorella, he's an outstanding NHL coach. Great coach. You know his yeah. track record speaks for itself. I think he's second all time among American born coaches in wins. He's got the cup. He's been to the final, two Jack Adams awards. You know the the upset that he pulled with Columbus against Tampa a couple of years ago. You know he's an outstanding coach. So. You know, it, it may be loud and it may be noisy and it may be messy, but you know you have to think he knows what he's doing. He's still, it's just you know he's doing something right in, in his inner uh, so it's um, it's going to be said. Uh, one other thing that is very important is is if you butt heads with your coach or maybe not butt heads, but say you have these animated discussions of of your play or your attitude, all that stuff. If that's the only conversation you have with your coach then even though it's no hard feelings, all that stuff, if there's never a personal conversation after about, you know, what did you do last night? How, how's everything going with your family? Stuff like that. Then that relationship never gets to the next level, right? This you sounds can like a personal experience out. by you. It's, <laughs> yes, exactly. You, you can hash things out all you want at the rink, but if you never, never connect on like a, a, a person to person level outside of the job, then it then it just becomes tough, right? Like I thought that was one of the best things about when when Barry Trotz was here is you'd have, although the conversations went very long because Barry liked to talk, you could you could at least have a a conversation of what what it's like to be a human, you know, what's going on outside of the rink, and if your coach is just on you all the time about about playing, uh, it, it doesn't doesn't grow. Yeah. And, and Torch has t- and Torch has talked about that. He said he's learned from issues he's had in the past with players where. It can't just be all about hockey all the time. You got to get to know the people. And he, he, when he, when I was talking to him, he said, you know, he's learned a lot from his kids. Like his son is is in the military, and you know, is command of officers, command of other, you know, soldiers. So there's some leadership aspect of it. His daughter is a school teacher. She's in charge of developing small children. So he kind of sees his role as a development role. And, and you're not just developing hockey players. And he said. You know, I don't know what I enjoy more is is developing hockey players or developing people. So I, I think he understands a little bit more of you can't just be beat them over the head with X's and O's. You can't just kill them when they make a mistake. You got to get to know these guys and understand who they are and what they are to get the maximum potential out of them. And, you know, it's not going to work every time with every guy. But I think, you know, from from talking to him, it seems like there's going to be a more concerted effort on his part to be better in those kind of situations where like you said you can't it can't just be hockey 24 hours a day with these guys there has to be more of a get to know the person as well as the player okay, and and the, we'll get the first look at John Tortorella and the Flyers in Washington on Thanksgiving Eve uh, we're going to get to Carl's stupid questions but Adam and I I want you to tell the story of the, the Capitals the night they won the Stanley Cup and, and we're together in Washington. <laughs> Adam loves this story. Uh, so we went to the view, cover the viewing party together uh, and, and kind of hung out all night. Uh, this is not my, my not my finest moment. No. So game ends, Capitals win, celebration. We're at Capital One Arena. 
And you I'm know, an after idiot. We, Let's start with I'm an and, idiot. Yes. Well, we'll get to why you're an idiot in a second here. We interview play. We interview some of the fans during the celebration, and then we retreat to the media room to all write our stories. And there are probably about a dozen of us in the room just kind of doing our job. And and someone yells out from the front of the room, hey, is the first championship won in Washington since I, I don't even remember what year you said. And there was a beat, and I yelled, game's in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I got caught up in the moment. Come on. I got caught up. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's so. I mean, there were some. There was some muttering that that I don't know if I can say on this podcast. But uh... now, 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 to be fair, did I did I not redeem myself when the line to get into the bar snaked around yes. the block and I called in and they said anyone with this guy gets in without the line? So did I not redeem myself? You, no, you did. You you took care of us afterwards after that night, but. Uh... And the bucket of beers, the bucket of beers at at, at three a.m. was free. Yes, that did make up for it, but still a good story. (laughs) That free booze always makes up for it. (laughs) Yes, no, that's uh, not not my finest moment, but it was it was it was a it was a fun night, even not being. I, I I was I was bitter, and my, my my editors know I was bitter not to get sent to Vegas to cover that. But being in D.C., having that story, being able to kind of be around my friends and 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 be it here, we are the champions at at, at the Irish Channel, uh, one of my favorite places on earth, uh, was fantastic. Uh, when we come back on All's Caps, uh, Adam Kimmelman from NHL.com will be the latest victim of Carl's stupid questions. Welcome back to All's Caps, the former capital defenseman Carl Alsner and, and NHL.com's Adam Kimmelman. I'm making copywriter Steve Wino. And now, as always, Carl's favorite portion of the show, Carl's Stupid Questions. <laughs> All right, Adam, let's get this All going. All right. All right, so um, this this question is uh, because, you know, obviously uh, what happened with the Queen the other day, shout out to the Queen family. That's, uh, that's uh, pretty heartbreaking. My wife, Mandy, is a, a massive uh, Queen fan, so... Um, not the band. Well, I was gonna say fan of both. <laughs> she yeah. she is she's a fan of both. Yeah, but both. Uh, but um, and, and this would be the era that she would live in. Um, is uh, is when the queen kind of came into power. But if you could go back to any time period or forward to any time period, which era would you like to to go through? Ooh, you know what? I would like. I, would, I was thinking about this the other day because I went to uh, see a movie with my college roommate. I would love to go back to my freshman year of college and kind of relive those four years again can i take the knowledge i have now with me though because i would really (laughs) love to do that because there are some decisions that i made in the (laughs) early to mid 90s that i would like to call a a mulligan on a a, uh hey the game's in vegas so to speak kind of moment sorry steve (laughs) yeah i I would like to do a little bit of a mulligan on those but yeah my my four years of college were just so much fun so outstanding like and, and this is like the geeky media guy in me. Like I got to do everything I wanted to do with the college newspaper from covering the NCAA tournament to the college. The co- I went to Monmouth. It's called Monmouth University now. It's a very small school at the Jersey Shore. But when I started, it's called Monmouth College. I got I was the editor of the paper when it became Monmouth University, which was a huge deal. And we printed the newspaper in color for the first time <laughs> in 1995. So, yeah, we were a little it, it's a small school. We used blue in the paper, and it was a huge deal. So, yeah, I would love to go back to that time period, those four years, and sort of do it all over again. That was a lot of fun. Early 90s. Early 90s. Early to mid-90s, yeah. A lot of good music then, too. So Well, that's that's... it, too. And I worked at the radio station also, and I I DJed midnight to 3 a.m. once a week. No way. The only people who who listened were the campus police officers, and they would call me for requests. (laughs) <laughs> so it was cool. great yeah I, it was like <laughs> my job at the end of the night sign off turn off the transmitter and lock the door wow. that yeah it, it was such a kick I loved it so much that's amazing yeah call i keep hearing college years were the best years of people's yep. lives i would have loved to experience that but that's all good okay so we're getting close to fall now we're seeing some leaves come off a lot of people say fall is their favorite favorite time of the year um, I'm I'm curious. What is your favorite thing about fall? I'll give you some examples. Is it the, that the nights start to get cool, which I really love? The leaves changing. Is it Halloween, Thanksgiving that are coming up? All a lot of sports, football, hockey, all that's happening. What baseball playoffs? If you're a baseball fan, what's your favorite thing about fall? Well, there's a few things. Well, one, you know, the hockey guy in me. The fall means training camp. The season's coming under, coming, getting ready. It, that's the fun part of the year. Baseball playoffs. I'm a huge baseball fan. Phillies are a little bit of a 
They'll, they'll, they'll make it into the, they'll make it into the fake playoffs. No, they're not. They're, they're not. making it into the fake they're playoffs. Gonna, they're not going to. They're this. dying on. They're dying on the vine. I hope Milwaukee enjoys the wild card. Um, <laughs> well, well, the, Nats, well the, Nats, the Nats the Nats had their time, and and they will see the playoffs next in twenty twenty six. Yeah. Well, that's just yeah. It, it's but no, the baseball playoffs are are probably one of my favorite things. So I'm gonna. I'm going to say my favorite part of the fall is, yeah, the baseball playoffs. Baseball playoffs. There you go. Yeah, I think a lot of people can agree with you there. Um, what's your least favorite rule in hockey? That you can ice the puck, killing a penalty. I think you should – I think <laughs> I, I would love – I think Brett – I can't take credit for that. I think Brett Hall said this years ago in a hockey news story that why are you allowed to break a rule when you're being penalized for breaking a different rule, Right. Like you hook a guy, you go to the box. Why can now your team disregard the icing rule? I think the game would be, I, I, that's the one rule I would change. I would say the, the team killing a penalty cannot ice the puck, make a skilled play. You can get it out. You guys, I mean, look, you were the best of the best of the best. When you played, you guys got there for a reason off the glass and out. Yeah. So make a skill, <laughs> make a skilled play to get the puck out. That's it. That was that was my skilled plays, be able to get it off the glass <laughs> over everybody's head. <laughs> that was that was a saying, the Luke Shen saying, not all not always the right play, but never the wrong play. Just get That's the puck it. out, you know. And I, I mean, it's 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 an interesting thought for sure. It would uh, it would change things. Too many to stoppages. I I, I I I like the theory of it. It'd be too many stoppages. Unless you make it a penalty to ice the puck, and then well, on the penalty kill, and then everything well, goes no. nuts. Well, the, the the same icing rules apply. No, you then, but then, you, but then, you, then the game is three hours. We can't be doing that. that, that that's, no, <laughs> that's you're, you're, your your idea is not wrong. I just like that's the we, we got to speed up games, not not make yeah. them longer. Yeah, it's true. That's um, that, that's my devil's advocate. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it, I, I like I kind of like the idea though. All right, now if we could change one law, what would it be? What law do you not like? For me, it would be speed limit. <laughs> I like. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, you know, yeah. I could I, I could do I could do without speed limits. Ooh, gosh. Um. I'll say this too, because this bugs the heck out of me. Is and well, I mean, it is it is a law, and I like it, but I would like there to be stiffer fines for people who don't stop for people in crosswalks. Yeah, I cannot. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, stand it. I almost drove into the other lane to get someone to stop because this guy was waiting there, and I was waiting for him for probably like a good forty-five seconds, and not a single car stopped. So I'd I'd like to have, I guess, stiffer stiffer penalties for not stopping in uh, crosswalks. But that's just me. You know what? Here's one I would I would enact. Not a law I would change, but a law I would enact. You go to any website. You want to watch a video. You got to sit through two 15-second pre-rolls or whatever. I would enact a law. No pre-roll ad can be longer than seven seconds. <laughs> I like That's that. what I would do. One, and it's seven. If you can't get your, your product's point across in seven seconds or less, <laughs> you, then, then you can't do it. And it's one, and that's it. That would be my, that would be my rule. Yeah, that's so funny. I, 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 yeah, I hate that when you're like fast forwarding through something and then all of a sudden oh, here comes another God. one that's two yeah. minutes long or whatever. Yeah, major piss off. Um, okay, back to breakfast. Um, favorite breakfast? What is it? Oh gosh, um, I would go with a Swiss cheese and tomato omelet with hash browns. Wow, Swiss cheese and tomato Love omelet. Love Swiss cheese. Love Swiss cheese. Okay, interesting. I have not heard that one before. And it is my browns. favorite. It is my favorite kind of cheese. Okay, there you go. What and kind of hash browns? Brown? Dynamite. Yeah. You, the you, shred. You know the well. You know the shredded ones that you get at Denny's. They're pretty good. And then the the actual cut potatoes. They're good too. It depends what you season them with. Little like little onion, little grilled onion, yeah. some pepper. Yeah, I could do that with with <laughs> eggs. Yes, yeah, so good. I like I like when you when they do shredded and then they press them down yes. almost like a pancake and then they're like really crispy on the outside yeah the well, crispier the better so good um okay last one for you here if if you could uh well we got a little music happening is that a fine that's a fine that's, that's a fine, a fine. Well, look this, this, this is this is embarrassment on on my age the entire time <laughs> <laughs> i am the fine master so there pay up go. there's 20 um okay if you could switch fields uh, and do anything, you know, and be, you know, be impactful in any of those fields. What would it be? Would you want to get into finance, tech, healthcare? You know, be a, become a doctor all of a sudden. What what field did you want to switch to? Oh, I got it. Um, one of the my kid used to play baseball. One of the his teammates, his mom was a taster for Tasty Cake. 
Come on. Seriously, we got <laughs> professional she a, taster. She was a taster for Tasty Cake. So any of the good Tasty Cake stuff, and, and Steve's from Philly, so he knows oh, yeah. the good Tasty Cake stuff. Yeah, that's her That's her job. Wow. I that's could a, do that job. That could be a job I would enjoy. That's an amazing job. I that's a dream she went, job. To college, she went to college for it. She's told me, she told me the whole story. Her degree is in like... Um, Food safety and management from Penn State, I think. I think that was her major. But yeah, that's her job. She's a college degree in food tasting, and that's what she does now. That might be uh, the the best uh, college course that you could possibly take, right there. It's not so well, that or golf. Think. Well, that or golf. I took golf, golf when I was in college. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, you're, so you're my <laughs> ringer then. I gotta call you up. I might, might oh, I didn't help. say I was good. I didn't say I was good. I said I took one class. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Eight to, eight to disappoint specific, you, but, please. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Okay, there's your six. Uh, let me just quickly add this up here. Um, I'm I'm a little nervous about the icing the puck on the PK because I would not have had a job in the NHL. <laughs> I, was say, I, I was gonna say I know your audience here. Forgot my audience. <laughs> yeah, audience, my yeah. bad. But uh, puck you, over you, the glass would have gotten you points. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I like that rule for the same reason. I'm I okay like with it. Thing. Yeah. yeah. You're okay with with the penalty for the puck over the well, glass. Well, well, I Carl, am. Carl, we, 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 Carl, we can we can debate that one later because we, I'm sure we, we each have a lot of thoughts on this one. Yes, I got a lot of thoughts on that. Don't mess with the stay at home defenseman, please. <laughs> um. Okay. Your total here is. 144 points, which uh, nice. looking Take just quickly at my list puts you one above Brian Helmer. Um, okay. so you're, you're you're sitting pretty good. You're in the top half of our of our uh, group, and I got to show people this because we're we got quite a few people. So wow, that's this a hell of a list. This is top it, half. You're doing yeah. pretty good. We're gonna All need right. to put like a leaderboard together at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we talked about this, Carly. Like, when training camp starts, we'll go to that media room at at MedStar, and we'll kind of we'll digitalize mm-hmm. this list. All right, sounds good. And everyone can see nice. where everybody is. Awesome. Yes. Good job. And, thank and, you. It was fun. And Adam, thank you very much for joining us on All's Caps. Absolutely. This was a great time, guys. Everybody, thanks for listening. More things are happening around the Capitals. Training camp starts in a couple weeks. Rookie camp next week. We will talk to you next week.